go, go in and mess it up with. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, not just the little ones.
to uh, our service today. Uh, we had a great day yesterday with the welcome and doctor service uh, yesterday afternoon and now today uh, we have another special service as we have the Baptist reopen and God willing later on Teddy will be going through the waters of baptism. We look forward to that and may God help us as we share together just some information uh, for the week ahead, uh, that is the club activities we will continue Tuesday and Friday, uh, and then small groups are going to change this week just for practical purposes. So um, we're just going to do a prayer meeting, and it will be on Tuesday night, half past seven in the back in the back hall. So no small groups. Uh, so it'll be, but the prayer meeting is going to be on Tuesday for those of you who, who can manage. Uh, that will be at half past seven uh, and in the in the back hall. Uh, next Sunday is uh, going to be our harvest Sunday. So if you have got any non-perishable goods, tins, uh, rice, pasta, all that sort of stuff, then uh, please bring that. We'll have the table set up and uh, we will then distribute those to uh, Kirby and to Northwood Chapel as they have their food bank there. 
Uh, so that's next Sunday, service time as normal at 11 o'clock. And then on Sunday the 15th, again, uh, we will have the uh, baptism open, uh, or baptistry open, as uh, we have the girls being baptised on that Sunday, uh, Rebecca, Beth and Addie, and we look forward to that uh, as well. But we did have uh, refreshments yesterday and there are a fair number of sandwiches left over and other things. So refreshments today, um, please do go through and uh, take all you can. Uh, uh, I mean we got through a fair bit yesterday but there's always uh, a little bit more. Okay, I think that's everything for the moment. We're going to read together uh, from Psalm 98. And it's verses 4 to 6, and let's read that together. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises with the lyre, with the lyre, with the sound, and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. We're going to sing a couple of hymns. Cut uh, out my silk hampers yes. yesterday, didn't we? Uh, okay. yeah. This cotton and paste business. <laughs> this is where I've changed the other hymns, isn't it? Okay, so tell out my soul, and then the Lord is by my side. Uh, so we're going to sing um, these two hymns. Let's stand and let's be ready to sing. Thank you for each other. Thank you that we can be a support to one another in all sorts of 
challenges and the different different things that we face and we would pray that uh, as we embark on another week that we'll be very conscious that we uh, go out to it um, enabled and equipped because of what we're able to do today and so we pray that we'll see the importance of the gathering of God's people that we'll see the significance of what it is to meet on a Lord's Day morning uh, on the, the first day of the week and to sing praise and to pray and to hear God's Word and we trust then that every aspect of our service uh, will reflect that and we will indeed uh, be blessed as we share with each other. The Lord our God we pray then that you will guide us in our thoughts, in our prayers and in all that we do that you will be honoured and we pray these things in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. The children are up for the crash. You have to go through the, the kitchen. Um, this door is locked by the way. Um, so if anybody has to go out to, to use the toilet, then you have to go out uh, the, through this door and through uh, the what kitchen. You, we're going to find out later on, Max. You're going to see the... Oh, I won't tell you what I'm going to Now we're going to um, do our catechism question and uh, today we're on uh, uh, question 40 and uh, we are going to be thinking again about uh, prayer. So as we have the question let me read that and then please respond with the answer and then we'll read in scripture. So the question today uh, is what should we pray? The whole word of God directs and inspires us in what we should pray, including the prayer Jesus himself taught us. And now we're going to read from Ephesians chapter 4, and it's a, a long reading, verses 14 to 21. It's actually one of Paul's prayers. Uh, he has two in Ephesians. This is the second one uh, that he includes in his letter. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend Behold all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power of work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Now we'll have the little uh, video clip as uh, we have uh, the question explained to us. When we're asking what we should pray about, we turn to the Bible instinctively because it's the Bible that inspires us and directs us. So whether it's Jesus reminding us that we should always pray and not faint, or Paul reminding the Philippians not to be anxious about anything, but in everything to turn to God in prayer. It is the Bible that keeps us on track. And uh, as we pray, we're really asking God to bring our lives and the lives of others into line with his purposes. And when we pray in that way, then we're able to pray with confidence. So we can pray for our world, that men and women might come to believe the gospel. We can pray for laborers to be sent into the harvest fields, as Jesus said. We can pray for the work of the gospel in our own lives so that we might become holy and joyful and thankful. And when we do all of this, we need to remember that God is far more willing to bless us than we are even to take the time to ask him. As Jesus said, if you being earthly know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to them that ask him?
Let me pray. God who hears, let your living word shape our desires and our prayers. May it challenge us to pray for things that don't seem possible. May it inform our view of you as we approach you as beloved sons and daughters. May it drive us to our knees as we recognise our need of you. Amen. Well, let's uh, sing another hymn as so uh, we lift my eyes to the hills from whence does my help come, my help come to the maker of the heavens and the earth. We look to our King. Let's stand and let's sing with this hymn.
Okay, let's be seated. So this is a baptism service that we are having today, and uh, Eddie later on will be going through these waters as uh, we baptize him in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We'll give some explanation to what we're doing uh, later on. Uh, but for the moment, Eddie's going to come and just uh, share something of his story of how he's come to faith and uh, what that means to him uh, today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I, I guess I should start by just, I think Paul mentioned it yesterday or uh, a few times, but this is a bit strange. Yes. I appreciate that. Not unique, but strange. Is that how you said it? <laughs> um, <laughs> unusual. Um, so, um, a little bit about kind of how, I came to, how I came to faith. I became a Christian when I was um, around about 16, 17 years old. Um, I, I had gone to church uh, as a child. My, my mum took me uh, to, uh, to an Anglican church in Harp in Cheshire, where I grew up. And um, I, I attended there until I was about 10. And then I, uh, I stopped going because I kind of felt like I knew what they were talking about. I, I got a handle on those things. I had the knowledge, I knew God, I knew God or so I thought. I could answer the questions that Sunday school gave to me. So, you know, who did David fight? That's right, okay, I got that squared away. I know, I know this stuff now. So when I, when I turned about 10, 11, I just started playing rugby uh, for the local team. And I didn't, I didn't really go back to church all that much apart from Christmas and Easter. And uh, that's kind of how I continued for a while. I would go to the church youth group on Friday nights, and uh, I, would, I would hear the gospel, um, the church, um, St. John's is a faithful gospel preaching church, and they never, they did never not preach the gospel to me, but God did not open my, my ears and my, my eyes and my heart to it uh, until later. Um, and so I just, I sort of carried on in this very legalistic, moralistic, as long as I know the answers, and. I, if someone asks me a question, then I'm a Christian. And as long as I kind of follow these laws I've, I've heard, then I'll be fine. I was christened uh, when I was very young, when I was about, uh, I think, uh, five or six years old. I uh, can't quite remember. And, um, and so I kind of thought I'd done everything that needed to be done. Um, when, I was, when I was about 17, uh, my dad was diagnosed with a, with a brain tumor, and um, he was given uh, only from memory, a, a month uh, to live, and that was quite a quite a shock. Uh, as you might you might be able to experience, you might, you might you might have experienced it, or you have to guess. And the the St John's, the church, and the church that my mum was going to, they were just really great um, in in how they loved us and how they looked after us. I just remember being contacted a lot. I remember the youth group um, just always wanting to sort of know how we were, letting us know they were praying, they were praying for them. And so um, this verse, um, so from 1 John chapter 4, it became, uh, it kind of, this is, I think, what opened my eyes to the, to the truth of the gospel. And that what I was doing was that I was not in a relationship with God. I did not know God for who he truly was. I just knew facts about God, which is not the same thing. Um, and so I, 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 I found this verse and it, it really hit home. So it's 1 John chapter 4 um, from verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Um, I experienced that, that love uh, from the church, from them, from a few churches, that, that real love, the love that is only given really from God, because he is love. And I realised I didn't love God, but that God loved me, and that he had sent his son for me. Uh, to die for my sin, for the rules that I couldn't keep no matter how well I thought I did. For the fact that I constantly rebelled against God, not that I knew him enough to be able to get away and pass any quiz or test that might be thrown at me. And so um, 
I, I, start, I, I stopped playing rugby. I started going back to church. Um, I, um, along with George, who some of you met yesterday, uh, George was the curate of that church when I uh, started going back. Uh, him and uh, my, the, youth, the youth minister there, Roger Forsett, who used to work at Merchant Taylor's up until recently, um, they both uh, were brilliant and explained the gospel to me and helped me uh, understand. And they, they helped me mature. I, I sort of worked for that church for a little bit as, a, as sort of an apprentice. And then I went off to university uh, in Liverpool and, and George, before I left, said, uh, you need to get in touch with Christchurch Liverpool. Go there, you're moving on, you're moving on Saturday go to Christchurch on Sunday. And I did. I met uh, Andrew Evans and Morris McCracken and stayed at Christchurch. And that from there has been a period of growth really. Uh, and maturing in Christ and still getting things wrong. Uh, and then uh, but asking for his forgiveness and knowing that he loves me uh, and that he died for me. And that he rose uh, to give uh, his all new life. And so that's, that's kind of the short story of how I came to faith. Um, the reason uh, for the decision to get baptised uh, is something I've just been wrestling with for, for a few years and uh, I wasn't sure if getting, um, if getting baptised uh, was the right thing because I, in a sense, had already been uh, baptised, but I wasn't sure if that was a, an effective and, and correct, uh, proper use of the sacrament. Um, and so I've been thinking about that for a while and speak, speaking with churches that I was in, um, they were happy to accept me into membership. Um, having been um, sprinkled uh, early in life, um, but I think uh, I have come to the realization that I, I have not, um, I have not done what the scripture asks, and that is to be baptized and make a public profession of that faith. And so I would like to do that now in front of all of you, uh, my, my new church family, um, after you <laughs> welcomed me as your pastor already. Um, but uh, but I hope that this. Um, it's just an encouragement in a sense. When I spoke to a friend of mine about this, he said, this is a good idea, you should do it, but with your new church, it is an, it is an encouraging thing to see a person who, is, uh, who has understood the gospel and, and knows that this needs to be done and to be baptized. So uh, uh, I hope it is an encouragement, I'm praying it is, and, um, and I will probably declare, declare to you uh, my trust in Christ. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Eric. It's lovely God takes us on all sorts of journeys, doesn't he? And, uh, but the most important is knowing Jesus Christ as our Saviour, and that I can testify to. And this uh, public demonstration, uh, this visual moment, we will be doing later on, and I'll just, as I say, put some explanation as to what's going on as we do that. But we're going to sing uh, another hymn <coughs> uh, before we read scripture, and uh, just give some brief comments this morning. <coughs> Yeah, it's 
you have your Bibles, you can turn to Ruth chapter 3. Uh, Ruth chapter 3. We're going to read the verses that are in that chapter and then make some comments before we come to our baptism service. <clears throat> One thing I uh, forgot to mention in notice is that in uh, church in Wigan, it's Pemberton Free Grace Church, uh, they are having a um, series of uh, meetings on Saturday, the 11th of November, 2023. Uh, there are uh, three seminars that they're going to be doing, and that is going to be led by Stuart Lithgow from the Open Air Mission, who we've had preaching here a couple of years ago, and then Jim Sayers, a church planter and pastor uh, from Grace Church in Didcot. You can get the details. Uh, of that, they're going to be talking uh, about why and you and your church matters, uh, making the gospel clear, some other topics. Uh, there's a notice at the back, uh, we'll leave a notice through in the other hall. If you are free and want to be part of that event, Saturday the 11th of November, starting at 10 o'clock. Ruth chapter 3, and uh, we read, Then Naomi. Her mother-in-law said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative, with whose young women you wear? See, he is at the winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor, um, to make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and but do not make yourself known to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and then cover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, All that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and uh, his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of her grain. Then she came softly and covered his feet and lay down. At midnight the man was startled <coughs> and turned over, and behold a woman lay at his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then, as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another, and he said, Let it not be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, Bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it, and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. And then she went into the city, and when she came to her mother-in-law, uh, she said, How did you fare, my daughter? Uh, then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, these six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said to me, You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. And she replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Well, we've been following the story in this book of Ruth. Uh, how did it start out? It started out actually in a famine. It started out with heartache as a family moved from Bethlehem meaning the house of bread, uh, where there was no bread, and they moved to Moab, a, a foreign part of the land. And there they went in the hope that somehow they would answer their problems. But what they met there, yes, they may have got physical food, but actually it would seem spiritually they are in a difficult place. Uh, she has to attend three funerals. Her, her husband dies, then her two sons, who have married women from Moab, also die, uh, and Ruth being one of those women. 
now it's time to go home uh, because the famine is over in Bethlehem and uh, Naomi decides I will go back she's bitter in heart she's empty she says I've got nothing to offer uh, she tells her daughters-in-law stay in your own country because if you come with me you're never going to get a husband you're never going to have a future one of the daughters-in-law she goes back but Ruth makes the statement that she does in chapter 1 and she says listen I'm going to be with you and it doesn't matter where you go I will go even to death itself and that's what it looked like it looked like it was to death because there was very little future so chapter 1 ends they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest so potentially there's a little bit of hope. Something might be happening here. Chapter 2 that uh, we did a fortnight ago is when Ruth meets Boaz. Boaz is the, the man in this story. There are just really three characters and uh, Boaz is the man. And he's a worthy man. He's an honourable man. He looks after Ruth in the, in the field where she's gleaning and makes sure she gets plenty of food. Makes sure that uh, nobody... Um, challenges her and she's there and she en enjoys that moment and being able to go home and report to Naomi just the benefits of being in the field of Boaz. So that's where we left it. Uh, she was in the field leaning away. So the future is, well, we've got food on the table, but not much else has changed. Boaz is uh, indicated potentially as a, as a relative. Is there some hope with him? Well, as Ruth goes out to the field, we're going to look at these uh, three characters and we're going to see just the, the hope that is being presented and looking to the future, planning for the future, and yet it's about God's plan. And really, this is a love story. It's an amazing love story and it's just developing all the time already the reader is asking the question in chapter two well hold on here's boaz and here's a, a young woman is there something that could happen now we get into chapter three she's busy in the fields and uh, she's just trusting everything that her mother-in-law is asking of her and she asks of her something quite significant because that's Ruth's away getting food for the table. Uh, Naomi's at home, no doubt, dusting and cleaning or doing whatever, whatever she was doing. Um, but she's obviously mulling over just the what's going to happen in the future. Where are we all going to end up? And the focus of attention for her is Boaz, our relative, verse 2. And uh, she has this plan. A dangerous plan anything could go wrong but it seems that everybody knows that God works things out but he's given us the wherewithal and the wisdom to uh, try and identify a way forward and apply certain things in our own lives and this is exactly what she's doing she's making claims that are legitimate that are part of her culture the potential that maybe Boaz would be a husband to Ruth. But it's fraught with all sorts of questions. Not least, how will he respond as Ruth does all that her mother-in-law te mother tells her to be, or rather to do. Whatever the plan is, and we've got it and we've read it. Notice what Ruth does as the plan unfolds, and in verse 5, she replied, All that you say, I will do. She's expressing her, her honor, her integrity. It's been seen already. Uh, Boaz will report on it too. And so I mean, Boaz doesn't really stand a chance, does he? Poor man. She gets all washed and clean. She gets all the max factor on. I mean, George was talking about perfume yesterday. All the perfume was going on, Ruth. 
and uh, she was made ready to go and uh, as he has uh, been busy at his work and then he's tired and he's ready to lie down when he lies down you go and lie at his feet all sounds very curious very strange but it's the way in to potentially um, having a conversation with this man that might end up in great blessing and great hope for the future. So on the one hand you've got Naomi doing all that she is doing. But I want to suggest also that on the other God is ordering events. He's bringing things together. And that's the way it works. We have uh, human responsibility and God's sovereignty. God is always acting, God is always working, but he's given us the wherewithal that we may do what we need to do, and uh, as that is brought about, God works what he does. And what we can say about God's plan and God's purposes is that nothing will stop them. And that's essential here for this little family. It's essential for them uh, that it will work out, but it's essential for all of God's purposes, and we'll see that more clearly next week. So we don't want to jump ahead of ourselves too much. Because at this moment, this plan, it's really a little bit all up in the air. We don't know how it's all going to come down. Well, you know the story and I know the story. But the first reader of this story doesn't know what's going to happen. So God is bringing things about too. And that as he does so, it, he unfolds the blessings that are for his people in the immediate but also in the future. But Ruth is a picture of trusting her mother in law, but I suggest trusting God. She's expressed it in chapter one. It's as if it's given a practical outworking in chapter three. It's one thing saying something, another thing doing something. But I will go. She's a foreigner. She's going to do stuff that maybe is not part of her culture. How is she feeling? This is my mother-in-law. I love her and I will do what she says. She's trusting God. That's the bottom line. Let me put it to you this morning. That we may be people that are trusting God. Trusting him, whatever's going on in our lives. There may be all sorts of challenges. I don't know what's happening in your life. And uh, there are the stuff that maybe you are able to tell people and stuff that you don't. And there's some things that are unknown. But we come before a holy God who's committed to his people. And the whole point of faith is that we ever learn to trust God more and more. It's the journey that we go on. We've heard a little bit of uh, Eddie's journey. It's trusting God. The second thing is once she gets to the threshing floor, we have Boaz and his commitment to this uh, young woman. Ruth is ready for her date. Naomi has fussed around, making sure everything is in order. Uh, she's looking her best, smelling her best, and off she goes. She has to listen very carefully to what her mother-in-law has said, making sure that she follows the, all the timings, and uh, she says the right thing at the right time. We have this picture, as we've indicated, of obedience, of trust, and respect for her mother-in-law, but also for the God that she is following. She's going to do her duty, whatever happens. So she carefully waits uh, until everything is settled for the night, and uh, then she comes away sleeping by the grave. He's at his, she's at his feet. Some think this is the place of humility, a place of service, a place of pleading, uh, of supplication. She uncovers his feet. And um, I, I, I suppose that uh, I don't like to think make things a little bit chilly into the night. Somehow, uh, Boaz wakes up with a start. And uh, he knows that something is not right. And 
There's this woman lying at his feet. And Ruth basically makes sure she says uh, what she uh, is supposed to say. And uh, she, she turns to Boaz, uh, identifying who she is. I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Basically, it's a marriage proposal. It's take me and protect me and watch over me. That's the kind of language that is being presented. And uh, you see, we've got a rescue plan here. This is Naomi's rescue plan to make things right, to give hope and to give a future. Boaz is a redeemer, or one of the redeemers. In the law of the day, there would be, if uh, somebody lost their husband and were in such a state uh, that uh, Ruth and Naomi were, they, they could make certain claims. And potentially somebody could uh, buy back certain things and purchase things on their behalf, and maybe even marriage might be involved, but not in every case, marriage might not be involved. So this is Naomi kind of putting something out there with a hope that it'll come back for her good and for the blessing of Ruth. Boaz is amazed that there's this young woman um, who loves God, is a worthy woman, she hadn't gone off for the younger men. I don't know how old Boaz was, but uh, he must have thought, I, I don't stand a chance uh, with, with this young woman. And, and here she is. And uh, help me. And Boaz says, well, actually, I would love to, but there's somebody else that is nearer to you than me. So we've got this thrown into the pot already. There's a question. Oh, is it going to work out? The reader's thinking, this is the great love story. It's like watching a drama on the telly, isn't it? And you get these two, two folks and they're made for each other. And, uh, but then somebody comes in on the side. And you think, oh no, what's going to happen? And it's as if somebody comes in on the side of this story. And, and uh, the reader's thinking, no, we can't. it's got to be Boaz. He's got to be the one that uh, gets the wife. We'll have to wait and see. But whatever we can say is that Boaz totally commits himself to this family in making the decisions that he does. He says, listen, uh, I, I, it, there is another redeemer. If he won't redeem you, then I will. I will take the cost. I will bear the burden. I will do absolutely everything. And as a kind of uh, indication of the promise, he, he sends her home not empty-handed. He sends her home with, uh, is it six bushels of wheat or something of that order? It's a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of wheat. It's in this garment, and off she goes. There is little doubt, it seems, that Boaz wants to be the answer to this situation. And he's committed totally to it, the great love story of this moment. I don't want to stretch it too much, but I do think, and chapter 4 will point forward to it more and more. There is a greater love story, isn't there? There's a love story of heaven to earth that God so loved that he gave. And nothing would stop that plan. There may be distractions, there may be things that come in the side. Will it work out? Yes, it will work out. As we can stand here, particularly on this Sunday morning, uh, as we approach the waters of baptism, the great picture of uh, Eddie having come to faith and the knowledge of Christ and that God loves him. The greatest love story is not royalty, is not our own story, whatever it was. The greatest is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit committed to humanity and to bring us home. And he's given us every indication that his, uh, his plan will work out, his purposes will be fulfilled. I put it to you this morning, do you know something of that great love, that great hope, that great redemption? Boaz is the Redeemer, he's the Rescuer. There's a greater Redeemer 
it's the king himself, it's Jesus. So we finish and we come back to Naomi. Uh, interesting what uh, <clears throat> Boaz says, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. You see, when she came back from Moab, she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, <coughs> because the Lord has uh, dealt with me in such a fashion. She came back with nothing. She was empty-handed. She had nothing to lay claim to. And it just seems that that sense is getting all turned around already, of course. She's received foodstuffs and uh, things have been operational for her, her benefit. But this becomes even more uh, potent and the potential for something greater is being advanced. It's like a ring on the finger, maybe, just about. This is the proposal, six bushels of, bushels of wheat. But hey, you're not going to turn down six bushels of wheat. And here it is. And all Naomi can say, well, let's wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. But how is it going to be settled? Which way is it going to go? Sounds to me, we've got Ruth and we've got Naomi, still in uncertainty. But it sounds to me we've moved on from chapter 1 and we've moved on from chapter 2. And here in chapter 3, it sounds to me... To some degree or another, there's these two women just resting in a moment. We're going to have to wait. We'll have to wait and see what happens. But we know one thing. This man will do absolutely everything to make the matter settled. And so, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, your emptiness has ended. Yes, there are struggles on the way. We heard a little bit about that. Uh, we need to confess sin. Uh, we need falter and we fail and we fall. But we've received blessings from heaven that are part of our lives. We have a deposit. And the deposit is a guarantee that there is a greater ahead. What's the greater? It is to be with Jesus. It is to be in heaven. And if you're a Christian this morning, then you have King Jesus living in your life by the Holy Spirit. The deposit has been granted to us. All the fullness of God is yours. And we have the hope that it has been settled in our favour. And we have the knowledge that we're going to be with the King. It's a great story. It's a love story. How's it going to end? We know how it's going to end. But we praise God that here, this morning, we can come and trust in our lives to this King and worship in Him. May God help us uh, so we continue and uh, think through all that God has done for us. Now, just a slight change in the program. Uh, we're going to sing our hymn now, and that will allow um, Eddie, myself, and Graham to get ready, as well as um, folks, if you can move the chairs, take out the uh, element, you don't go in with the electric, um, and just get, just get everything ready. Uh, and then, of course, the children will join us as well as uh, we are having the service of baptism. So we're going to be singing, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus' Blood and Righteousness. So we'll be standing to sing, and uh, we, if our folks could make sure they can uh, uh, clear the decks, and we'll be ready for the uh, baptism, of, baptism itself uh, in just a few minutes. Thank you.
Be seated. So we come to the moment in our service uh, when we baptize uh, Eddie. Um, it's an important time for us, uh, but also for him. Baptism is the great visual picture of what has already happened in the life of an individual. So one reason why Eddie tells his story, this occasion today is not making Eddie a Christian. Eddie is already a follower of Jesus. But this is a public proclamation and witness to the fact that he is a follower of King Jesus. Why it's important that uh, we witness that event. You can't just go off and have a baptismal service yourself, or maybe just get a friend, or we'll do it, just do it somewhere. Uh, no, it is a public declaration. It's for people to see and witness, and you can see it and witness to it. It's important because it's telling us uh, the fact that uh, Eddie has come to faith, and maybe this morning you're sitting here and you have yet to entrust your life to King Jesus. You have heard the story that we've heard. And maybe there are some things in your own heart and mind that that's where I am. I don't know King Jesus yet. I could answer the questions. I could do a quiz. But I don't know King Jesus as my Savior. Could be today. Simply asking Jesus to be part of your life. So we're, what we're going to be doing in a few moments is uh, we're going to get in the pool and uh, then Eddie will join us and uh, we will baptize him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as we believe the Bible teaches us to do. And as part of that baptism service, as we do that, uh, we will uh, put Eddie under the water and that's a picture of uh, death. Going down into the water is a picture of death. We don't think of that. He comes, he comes back up um, and that's a picture of being raised from the dead he is alive it's the picture of coming to know Jesus we are dead spiritually we all can only know life in Jesus and that's exactly then the picture that is being presented here this is not any special water it's not any holy water it comes from wherever it comes from it will get drained out, um, and it is what it is. But the act itself is more than significant as we uh, share together in this moment. So I think that's all I've got to say at this point in time. I did just test it there, so it's, uh, we're not we're not full boiling point. That's I can tell you that. Um, but we we will be able to share together in this moment. I think is this camera working? So no. Oh, here we go. So, if you can't see any, there we are. You'll see it in all its glory. So, uh, I'll get uh, Graham to come in with me first, and then we'll. Ooh. <laughs> 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 Maybe you want to just change your mind. Yeah. <laughs> you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. service we're going to pray uh, and then nobody move from their seats please uh, the guys will, will cover the pool over so that nobody else uh, ends up so, when you're 20 let's pray 
loving Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the opportunity of uh, sharing together in this wonderful moment. Uh, we praise and thank you for the great picture that we die and yet we are raised to life. Thank you that Eddie is in spiritual life. When he's 16 or 17 or whenever it was, the knowledge of having Christ as his saviour. But we thank you that this morning we've been able to declare that for everybody to see and hear. Lord, we pray that you'll help us, that we may be a people that will know that Christ is our King. Lord, we commit and commend then uh, the rest of the day to you. Watch over us in all that we do. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for your sake. Amen. Amen. Remember, we have refreshments, so do please uh, uh, hang around for those. Thank you very much indeed.